Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the last of this academic year uh, TCIPG uh, seminar uh, in the seminar series on resilient uh, smart grid energy systems. I'm really pleased today uh, to have uh, Dr. Ron Melton with us. Before I do that, I'll make just a couple of announcements. Uh, we will take a break, as is the academic tradition on these seminars. We'll still be working hard on our project, but uh, the next of the TCIPG webinars will be in September of next year. So watch your email for information on that. We're putting together a, a good lineup. But if you want to meet with us before then, uh, there is the occasion of our TCIPG uh, summer school, which will be the week of June 17, and please go to our website. Uh, we have a very good lineup of speakers. We actually have a very uh, large response, but there are still a few uh, places left. And if you were um, applied for a scholarship, if you're a student and applied for a scholarship to attend, I believe those announcements have gone out. Yes, those announcements have gone out. So congratulations to the 40 students that uh, won scholarships. Okay, let me introduce uh, Ron Melton. Ron's the director of Battelle-led uh, uh, PNNL Smart Grid Demonstration Project, the administrator of the Gridwise Architecture Council, and the senior technical leader of uh, Smart Grid Research and Development at PNNL. He's uh, been doing this for 30 years, sometimes within the national laboratories, sometimes uh, with private companies, and he really has a broad perspective. I really enjoyed meeting him in the time he's been here. Has a broad perspective on cybersecurity issues, but also much more broadly how these cybersecurity issues fit in in overall system issues as you need to architect uh, uh, things within the smart grid. Um, I won't say more about what he's going to talk about because I want to give him all the time he can, but as you see here, he's going to talk about something called transactive control in a large-scale demonstration that's been going on in the Northwest. So Ron, we're really happy to have you here. Thank you very much. And I guess I should just say one technical issue. For those of you who tuned in on the WebEx, uh, there is no video today on the WebEx, but you can simultaneously with the WebEx where you can ask questions if you want to click on the other link we have, you can see the video as well as the audio and slides on, on this presentation. So Ron, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming to visit. So thank you very much, Bill. So this might be a little bit of a, a uh, diversion from uh, topics you would have in TCIPG normally because I'm not going to really say much of anything about cybersecurity but talk about a different approach to Managing, uh, managing the power system that, of course, would require certain cybersecurity considerations. And if people have questions about that, they can certainly bring them up. So I'm going to um, start by giving you a little bit of the motivation for the work that we're doing, which builds on work at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory going back into the late 90s. Uh, then I'll uh, give you an overview of the project itself then uh, concentrate uh, for a bit on the theory, if you will, behind this thing that I'm referring to as transactive control, talk about how we're actually implementing it in the project, and give you a, a current status of the efforts in, in the project. So as, as many of you know, hopefully, the power system is uh, changing dramatically as we go through uh, the modernization of the system, but also as we go through the combined technical and political processes that are introducing uh, large numbers of renewable generation sources, especially on the bulk power system supply side. The um, introduction of those new sources you know, gives us new challenges uh, integrating those renewables. We, of course, also have all of the same problems that the power system has faced uh, uh, for years about how well we use the assets of the system, how well we keep the system reliable, of course, driving costs down as low as possible. And now we also have a new factor in new end uses, in particular electric vehicles, that if not managed well could drive up uh, new critical peaks uh, during peak times of the day. So we've made or are making investments in smart grid technology. So now we've got an opportunity to do something to help solve these problems with approaches 
that fully engage all of these different resources across the system to coordinate their activity, to coordinate their behaviors, to try to address these, these changes that we're facing. In particular, looking at the, the new uh, characteristics of the supply side, which used to be deterministic, it used to be, uh, of course, responding to the random nature of loads, but, but from a control point of view in a very deterministic way. Um, and now we have to deal with the stochastic nature of that. And as well, maybe we can do a better job with the stochastic nature on the load side. So this is the, this is the uh, objective, if you will, within this thing, transactive control. And we've actually added coordination to the label because in many cases what we're doing is more trying to coordinate the behavior and, and uh, activity of all of these different assets in the system as opposed to necessarily literally controlling them. Trying to do that from end to end, all the way from the generation side through to the load side, and at each of the points along the way where we may have the opportunity to affect the system. In particular, um, bringing into uh, play the opportunity for distribution system operators to have influence over loads or other resources to solve problems they may have in their distribution <coughs> system. So it's not all just about things like locational marginal pricing to help manage the transmission system. There's, there's distribution system concerns that need to be addressed as well. So with that, let's look at a, a broad definition here. Uh, why do we call these approaches transactive? We call them transactive because they have a market or economic sort of construct that they're embodying. And they're using those market or economic type constructs as a basis for doing this management of the different moving pieces of the system. In particular, we're looking at a convergence here of the control problems of the grid, so the engineering problems of the grid, with the economic activity and economic problems of the grid. And bringing these together, uh, which as you'll notice here in the slide, tend to be talking about things on different time scales, which makes the problem interesting. And bringing those together in what you might think of as sort of transactive networks, if you will. There's one of the key features of the approaches that we're developing here. And that is on the first line here, which, which uh, for those of you old enough to remember um, the, the startup of a lot of activity in the United States on global climate change research back in the early 90s, there was a popular slogan in the global climate change research of, you know, think globally, act locally. Well, so let's apply that same sort of a notion here in the electric power system. We want to be able to have information about the global state of the system and the global needs of the system and take local actions to help resolve or improve that global situation. But so of course that implies we're talking here about distributed approaches as opposed to centralized approaches. And we have a construct that we use in this sort of an approach that we call a node. So a node is basically a point where we can put decision making uh, processes, and decisions here that affect the flow of power in the system. And we have two particular signals that we define, which we'll talk about in more detail later in the talk. But one, a feedback signal that talks about how energy is being used in the system, in particular by loads, and a signal that we call an incentive signal that represents the economic aspect. So if we monetize the cost, cost of power produced, cost of power delivered, cost of constraints that affect those processes. Now we can talk about this incentive signal, which, which uh, I'll say more than once, it represents the cost of power delivered to any given point in the system. So similar in concept to a locational marginal price, but different in principle because of the way it's derived. So the node, the node is that point, or those points in the system where I can look at my local situation, I can look at my local constraints, I can make decisions that will affect the incentive signal that I send to all my neighbors that represent what I need at that point in the system to have happened. So we're going to go through a simple example of this in a few minutes to hopefully you know, make this a little bit more real. Two important points. A node, and one of the most important forms of nodes, of course, is going to be uh, edge nodes at your house, for example, or in your vehicle smart charger, or in a, uh, in a uh, commercial building. Nodes responsiveness 
we think sort of philosophically needs to be voluntary. In other words, the node owner needs to be the one determining how responsive that node is going to be. We had an example of this in the work we did in, uh, in the 2006-2007 timeframe in the uh, Gridwise Olympic Peninsula demonstration where we worked with 115 houses and a smart thermostat uh, implemented for those houses to show that we could manage a constrained feeder through demand response in a double auction market with those, those houses responding to a five minute real time price signal. And a key feature of that was a slider associated with a smart, smart thermostat that the homeowner could say, I, I want more comfort. In other words, I'm, I'm gonna be inelastic if I'm gonna have the most comfort. I'm not gonna respond to the price signal. I'm gonna go with my thermostat set point or I'm gonna be more responsive, I'm gonna be more elastic, I'm gonna allow myself to, to respond in the, the maximum way possible to that price signal. So the, the owner of the node needs to be the one setting that as opposed to somebody imposing that on them. The other key point here for this to really be widely used, nodes need to be automated. And especially again at edge nodes like residential nodes, you need to, to let homeowners determine a basic usage pattern and then it needs to be automated after that. So it can be responding uh, continuously in whatever time frame has been defined for that technique, in our case, a five minute time frame. So why, you know, a little bit more broadly are we doing this? Well, we've got a list of challenges for the power system that we put together to, to explain this. Um, and one of the, the, the first one is really one of the most important ones, I think, in that if we look at the future of the system, the power system itself with increasing number of sensors and intelligent devices, and then look at the edge of the system on the load side, where we have increasing numbers of intelligent devices that will begin to be devices that manage their consumption of electricity and manage their charging patterns, whether it's electric vehicles or other devices. And we potentially have situations where were we to try to use a traditional approach to load management like direct load control, we would be having to try to optimize the control of millions or tens of millions of devices. If we want to do that in real time, or even more importantly, if we want to be predicting that so we can do analysis of where we're going and, and, and try to optimize things, there's no way we're going to do that centrally. It's just not going to work out well. So we've got to look at distributed approaches where we can do local optimizations with small numbers of devices that are tractable. And so that's, this is one of the big motivations for us for a technique like this. Interoperability is a key, key requirement. These techniques have to be simple from an interoperability point of view so that you can enable multi-vendor solutions, enable wide-scale deployment and adoption of these sorts of things. Uh, similar argument applies to privacy and security. You need to keep things simple in terms of signals and, and interactions so that you avoid large-scale privacy and security issues. And likewise, the same arguments apply to scalability. By keeping the techniques as simple as possible and the signaling associated with them as simple as possible, you support the possibility of large scale up. We've also, for the techniques that we're developing, kept the techniques uh, the same at any scale. So if I apply this at a transmission substation, the basic technique is the same as if I'm applying it at a distribution substation, as if I'm applying it in a home energy management system, as if I'm applying it in your smart toaster or coffee maker so that you don't have to worry about a completely different technology depending on where you're applying it in the system. Part of the idea here is that you're selecting the most economic asset or resource in the system at any given point in time. So we're trying to create a level playing field through techniques like this and that's part of where the economic constructs come into play is to help enable that level playing field approach. I mentioned uh, customers or node owners being the ones that determine how much they play the game, and this is the customer autonomy sort of approach, um, incentivize customers to do the right thing and then enable them to do the right thing at their choice and their option of the level at which they do that. Um, ultimately, we're trying to manage multiple objectives. Uh, we do that by monetizing everything, everything that we can, and by creating uh, monetization as the common approach, the common sort of way of describing our problems, we can, we can hope to achieve the uh, multiple objectives. And lastly, but not, not least, is uh, making sure we can describe these things in a way that we can either empirically or analytically or both understand their behaviors from a stability and controllability point of view. 
So again, by doing all that, we're trying to link all the different values, all the different interests in a multi-objective control sort of approach to simultaneously achieve the various benefits that you see here. Um, I'm not going to go through and read those all off, but I'll leave it there for just a moment so that you can look at them if you'd like. So that's the background. That's, that's why we're doing these things. So what are we doing on the Northwest Demonstration Project? This is the largest of the 16 uh, stimulus package funded regional demonstration projects. Ours happens to be a $178 million project. Um, $89 million of that coming from the federal government in the ARA funding. The other funds, and actually it's more than half because everybody's spending more than they had expected to spend, um, is, is coming as cost share from all of the participants. It's a five-year project. I'll show you the, the overall schedule for that in a minute. In terms of the number of consumers involved across the 11 utilities that are participating in the project, roughly 60,000 metered customers are impacted in five states. You can see Washington in green there, Oregon in blue, Idaho in maybe that's magenta, um, uh, Montana in orange, and Wyoming there in yellow. We have all different sizes of utilities. Uh, the utility labeled number eight there in northeastern Oregon is the city of Milton Freewater. It's about uh, 4,500 customers, small municipal utility. Um, I'm bringing them up both because they're the smallest but also they're one of the most innovative utilities that we've worked with. They've been doing demand response to manage BPA demand charges for over 28 years. And they're just modernizing that approach now, working with us on the transactive control technique. We've also got the University of Washington involved. Um, University of Washington, uh, through this project, put 200 meters into their campus. They only had metering at the edges of the campus before. Uh, where they get their feeds from Seattle City Light. Now they've got 200 meters on all their buildings and some submetering in some of the buildings. So now they actually are getting some understanding of how they're using power. So we're doing all this for the reasons listed under why there. Of course, all of the demonstration projects are expected to develop da data that can be used to understand costs and benefits. We have this second bullet about a communications protocol with interoperable incentive signals. So this is the transactive control I've already started telling you about as we develop that technology to provide input to the standards processes. And one of the key reasons in the Northwest why we're interested in this technology is to help us facilitate wind integration, which is, of course, a big problem for us in the Northwest. The project team is uh, like this. We've got the Department of Energy on the top, of course, since they're supplying a huge chunk of change here. We've got uh, Battelle leading the project. We're wearing our Battelle hat here as opposed to our Pacific Northwest National Laboratory hat. Bonneville Power Administration, who provides uh, a significant uh, amount of funding for the project that pays our costs at Battelle as a cost share for, for DOE dollars. We've set up a formal project review board that are senior managers from all of the participants that help us uh, keep the project on tap. And then you can see here our, we call them project level infrastructure participants, which are technology providers, including a three tier that does wind forecasting, Alstom Grid with their energy management system, market management system tools. IBM, TJ Watson Research Center, Ron Ambrosio, many of you probably know Ron, and his team, a company called Netiza that has a data management appliance acquired by IBM after the project started, and last but not least, Quality Logic that does interoperability and conformance testing, which has been incredibly important for us to have test harnesses and interoperability and conformance testing capabilities as we implement these technologies. And then you can see the 11 utilities here over on the side. I'm not going to try to read them all off. Um, I'll have a, a, a reference at the end to our website where you can get details on all the utilities that are participating. But just to mention, it's IOUs, munis, rural electric co-ops, and public utility districts all involved, so the full mix of different utilities. Who, who is University? Uh, Washington State University is part of the Avista project. And, it, and there's even a third university involved. Central Washington University is involved with City of Ellensburg, helping them with data, data analysis. So, so this, is, this is our starting point for describing sort of some of the more of the idea here. So this, this cartoon of the power system came from a napkin sketch over dinner one night while we were out in uh, New York to talk to IBM with uh, one of our colleagues from BPA explaining to him what we really were talking about here. So the notion is, if you look at this simple cartoon sketch, rough, a rough estimate of the topology of the power system, 
we're following the flow of power in the system. And at any point in the system where we can affect the flow of power, like say let's pick on that distribution transformer right in the middle there, we have a transactive control node that is operating on an incentive signal that's delivered to it. It takes into account its local, local problems, if you will. It modifies that incentive signal as necessary, reflecting the operational objectives, thus the operational objectives arrow in the bottom, and sends that down to its neighbors, roughly speaking to people downstream from it in the flow of power. In fact, it actually has to send it to all neighbors because now we never know which way the power is going to flow. It could be going the other way at some point in time, so everybody has to know. And looking at it the other way, in terms of our status and opportunities arrow, this is what are, the, what are the loads going to do? Or what are the other distributed energy resources going to do? Both of these are forward forecasts in time of what the plan is, in our case, for the coming three days as to how the cost of power is going to be and how loads are going to behave. And through the communication of these two signals through the system at these decision points called the transactive control nodes, all of the, all of the good stuff happens. So um, just, to, just to repeat here, it's a distributed method, transactive control for coordinating responsive grid assets wherever they happen to be in the system. We've got the incentive signal, which is this cost of power delivered or a synthetic price forecast, and we've got the feedback signal rep representing consumption patterns, and they're, they're going through each other or interacting with each other at the nodes. So what do these incentive signals look like in a little bit more detail? First, um, they're basically looking at the unit cost of the energy, unit cost of power delivered, and they're taking into account the variety of things that we see on the list here. Of course, fuel costs or equivalents to fuel costs are important. Infrastructure cost, which turns out we found is not quite as easy to include as one might think it should be. Um, capacity constraints. Uh, there may be market factors that have to be reflected there. There could be uh, green power preferences reflected there. Profit would be reflected there. Anything that you can monetize that has to do with the cost of power. And we have created in our implementation approach a toolkit that has a basic shell of functionality for a transactive control node. And then into that shell of functionality, one can put resource functions that represent the supply side. So resource functions calculate incentive signal value. And we'll see in a minute, we have load functions that look at the load side. And so what we've actually implemented are resource functions for wind, fossil generation, hydropower, demand charges, which are a load side function, but they're a function of the, where the incentive signal value needs to be changed locally to reflect the estimate of when demand charges would occur. Um, infrastructure costs, uh, transactive energy costs, and in imported energy costs. Looking at the feedback signal side, we have a similar problem. We're looking there at the predicted um, um, use of power. And we have a number of local conditions. I don't think any of them will surprise you here that have to be taken into account. One that you, you may not have thought about is we have to make a, a very uh, absolute and, and useful distinction between inelastic load, load that, that for whatever reason cannot respond to a signal, and elastic load. We have to clearly separate those because it's the elastic load complement that we care about. That's the one where we can have action take place. Then we, we depending on the type of load setting, we may need to take into account weather impacts. Um, and there are simple models to do that, occupancy impacts. Um, we've got battery storage uh, systems in the project, so we have to look at uh, behavior of the battery storage systems. Um, there may be local policies, practices, and so forth. We need to uh, anticipate demand response actions. Um, in some cases, we have in-home portals that are just displaying the relative cost of power, so we actually have a couple of simple models to try to predict consumers' response to just a display in the house. And we also have to distinguish between the type of response we're modeling is real-time response, uh, time of use response, or an event-driven response. And we've really collapsed those last two into one in the final analysis because they're very similar when you get down to actually implementing them. So we have actual load functions implemented for battery storage, as I mentioned. Uh, Portland General Electric has a five megawatt battery storage system, for example, that they've introduced. and then. Uh, Idaho Falls Power and Lower Valley Energy and uh, Benton PUD have some smaller scale battery storage systems. Uh, bulk and elastic load for everybody. Everybody has to have that function. Then we have building thermostats, 
for uh, HVAC type uh, operations, water heaters. There's a lot of direct lo load control of water heaters being done by the participating utilities. Um, dynamic voltage control, there's several of the utilities doing uh, conservation voltage reduction dynamically potentially to respond to the transactive control signal and as I mentioned portals and in-home displays. So this is the rough structure of what is inside of one of these transactive control nodes. You can see coming in from the left, incentive signals are coming in from neighboring nodes. On the right, you see the load estimate or forecast signals coming in from neighboring nodes. And the job of this node is to take all of that information into account. So that's the think globally part. And then incorporate local information you see coming up from the bottom, taking into account what any assets that might be attached to this node, say a battery storage system, for example, and um, calculating what update, if any, is going to be made to the incentive signal, to the feedback signal, and sending out any control signals to the local attached assets to take action according to what was planned. We do worry about that. I'm sorry, repeat the question. Yeah, oh, sorry. So the question is, what about proving stability of the, of the control loop? Yes, we worry about that. We'll be working on that empirically with our effort. Um, with the scale that we're able to apply this on the demo project, so this is the theory part right now. The scale we can actually apply, we don't have a lot of feedback loop, um, and I'll explain why when we get a little bit further. But that, that is something that concerns us. And we have, uh, in the timing model of the system, some timing considerations to help assure stability. But we also, um, either ourselves or would welcome somebody else to work with us to look at the theoretical side of that and, and you know, hammer it home on the theory side, too. So now here's my example I want to show you to try to you know, drive this home a little bit. To this. And it, it'll partly answer your stability question, but not completely. So we're going to look at a little transac transactive control electric vehicle charging example. So I want you to imagine a neighborhood, a cul-de-sac, say, three houses all fed by the same pole top transformer. Everybody has an electric vehicle. They all want to do a level two fast charge. And we're going to have three different behaviors by the consumers. We're going to have one consumer wants to charge. You know, I don't care what it costs. I'm going to charge when I want to charge. We're going to have another consumer that has a flexible charger that can vary the charging rate. And then we've got a Walmart shopper consumer who they want the bargain. They're looking for the best deal they can. So let's take a look at how this uh, goes about. So there's our three, three customers all hanging off the same transformer. We're going to be looking forward in time here at what is going to go on. So here's where we start with no charging on the horizon. We've just got the, uh, the uh, line in the middle with the little X's on it is the, um, is the um, transactive incentive signal value. So you see it's going up a little bit as the, as the peak loads uh, in the evening sort of come on. But it's basically not changing much. You see here we're talking about between you know uh, 3 and a half and 6 and a half cents a kilowatt hour or something like that. And you can see the base load of the houses on the bottom. And you see across the top there in the red line the constraint on the transformer. So we're saying if we go above 40 kilowatts on that transformer, we're starting to overload it. We're reducing its service life. OK, first guy reveals his plan. He wants to start charging about uh, uh, 4 o'clock here. He's going to charge for two and a half hours. So we see with that plan revealed, we see that the um, total load bumps up. That's the blue solid line. OK, no problem. We're not. We're not going to be overloading the transformer. House 2 reveals their plan. Well, they want to do the same thing, but, but staggered in time. So they want to charge for two and a half hours starting at 4.30. Now we actually are going to bump up just above the transformer limit. House 3 reveals their plan. They want to do a two and a half hour charge too, now starting at 6 PM. Now we have a really significant bump up above our transformer limit. OK, so the houses have all revealed their plans to the transformer now. Now it's the transformer's turn. The transformer calculates the impact of that charging pattern on the reduced service life of the transformer. And it comes back with the new pattern of the transactive incentive signal and says, OK, you know, I'm going to be up around 18 cents a kilowatt hour for a little while there if you guys do this. So. 
now the houses get a chance to respond again. So now they see what the impact of their combined plans are. They aren't revealing those plans to each other. They're just telling the transformer about them. So now the transformer communicates the impact back to everybody because it serves all of them, and they get a chance to respond. House one is our flexible charging house. So house one says, well, in that scenario, I'm going to extend my charging time out, and I'm going to go to a half, half rate charging um, to, when we get up to that high, high price zone. House two doesn't respond. They don't care. They're going to pay whatever it takes. So that's why we don't see a house two response. House three says, hmm, I don't like this at all. I'm going to shift out in time to where the, the price signal says price is going to be good again. And so now the three houses have revealed their plans, their new plans. Now it's the transformer's turn again. Transformer says, OK, with these new set of plans, you can see here I still bump up against the limit on the transformer. So I'm still going to have the transactive incentive, incentive signal be up a little bit there, but not up, up really high like it was before. And then I'm going to drop back down faster. For purposes of, of the illustration here, this is where we end. So this, this plan, once revealed, everybody's happy with this plan. And this is now our, our loosely phrased contract going forward that everybody will have agreed that this is the plan we're going to follow, you know, barring some other perturbation in the, in the loads or in the cost. So the trick in the stability is to make sure that you construct these algorithms uh, so that you get this, this type of behavior and that you've, you've, you've captured it for the future. So we have a question here. Okay. Uh, one thing I was curious about, you didn't have anybody in there that was playing the supply role, as in they were going to uh, look at that high price and say, well, I would sell at that time. Right, we could have. If one of the houses had a local battery storage system, then that would obviously be a Even time. their car, because that's one of the main things that, that they're uh, you oh. know, punching out with these cars is you could make money on it if you want to let it play the grid. Yeah, the, the manufacturers, of course, haven't enabled that sort of use of the cars yet. But at some point, they might. And you're right. Then the car, one of the, the, the Walmart shopper, for example, might say, well, I'm going to sell, and then I'll charge later. Absolutely right. That could have been part yeah, of an the Ancillary services, example. I think, are going to become fairly lucrative. Uh, it might. <laughs> OK, uh, so is the constraint on the transformer a soft constraint? Because you're still violating it a little bit. Well, it turns out, it turns out what I learned as I, as I started working on this example, I figured, you know, you, you exceed the limit on the transformer and it blows up and there are fireworks. It turns out transformers are much more resilient than that. There are actual algorithms out there, formulas for transformers, taking ambient temperature, the type of oil, and all this kind of stuff that you can calculate how much the service life is reduced for a given overload. And so that's basically how you monetize this, is by calculating that service life reduction. So Ronald, I, I, I guess you'll have to solve this problem first of, um, you know, the good, the good guys, and even the problem of people wanting to sell. But I was wondering, if you're even thinking about, you know, somebody trying to say, here is my schedule, just to manipulate the prices. For example, I can say I'm going to charge at this time, let the prices go up, and then I'll say I'm actually going to sell at that time and actually don't charge it. So yeah. that's one that's one issue. So is there consideration uh, for those kind of things at this time? Well, we, we recognize that as a problem, and we haven't tried to solve that problem. But if if you if you if you had wide scale deployment of this, uh, and you have a question here to answer first, am I using this this transactive incentive signal strictly as an engineering economic signal? to uh, affect the behavior of devices, or am I using it as a literal economic signal where money's going to change hands? If, if, I'm not having, if I'm using it in the first case as an engineering economic signal, I don't necessarily need to worry about that. I still might, but I don't necessarily. If I'm using it as a literal economic signal with money changing hands, I do have to have um, either um, certified algorithms that are, d that are tested and, and verified that they prevent those behaviors, or I have to have some sort of market regulation 
applied on top of that to detect gaming of the system and, and, and penalize that in some way. You, you still have to worry about that, absolutely. Hi. Um, so you said you're hitting the transformer limit uh, for that just one transformer, is it? Yeah. So then could you not, if you hit that limit, could you not ask for power from other, other utilities or other neighborhoods or whatever? And, 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 uh, well, in this example, you can't. Okay. Because this is a distribution feeder, and this is the last transformer in the line before the houses. So in, a, in the middle of the system someplace, absolutely. Uh, that, that's one of the reasons why you send the signals to all neighbors, because there may be a different path for power flow that will solve your problem, uh, that, but you reveal it through the exchange of these incentive signals and feedback signals. Okay, so... That's a, that was a good point to ask some questions because now I want to switch and talk a little bit about how we're actually implementing this. So, so what I showed you was sort of the theory and the hypothetical example just to try to drive home this notion of what we mean by transactive control. In the, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we have a power system with you know, a large multi-state balancing area for Bonneville, and we're going to primarily be talking about Bonneville's balancing area. And Bonneville uh, uses a notion of cut planes and flow gates in the way they operate their balancing authority. And we've taken that notion of cut planes and flow gates and used them to define uh, copper plate regions within the balancing area where we can deal with, with uh, the, the major power flows being between those regions. So these are the cross-hatched regions that you see in this diagram. The cut planes are the red lines that separate them and the flow gates are the blue double arrow lines that connect them. So these uh, large cross-hatched areas are what we refer to as transmission zones. And our challenge in the project then, uh, because for some odd reason, I really know the reason, but I'm going to pretend like I don't. For some odd reason, Bonneville wasn't ready to let us just stick this stuff into the bulk power system and start having it you know, affect operation at transmission substations and at the hydro desk and you know, transmission operations and so forth. So we actually simulate the bulk power side. So the Alstom market management system and energy management system models are being used with data fed from Bonneville, and you see the types of data here, load forecast, generation schedules, outages, things like that. Um, data, some of which coming from independent power producers in the region, and the data that 3-tier generates for us on renewable forecasts. That all goes into the Alstom models and they're calculating the cost, the, all the power flows between those transmission zones and the cost of power generated and delivered from one of those zones to the utilities that live beneath those zones. So each of the 11 utilities lives in one of those zones. There's 14 of them, so we have some zones that don't have a participant. And so we have a transactive incentive signal that is generated through a transactive control node that we operate at Battelle that gets its inputs from the Alstom model representing each of the different components of cost and the total power to generate that transactive incentive signal that you see as the downward arrow flowing from one of these transmission zones down to one of the utility nodes here that you see with the named utilities. <coughs> the utilities are generating a transactive feedback signal and sending it back to the um, transmission zone node. Unfortunately, because of the simulation component, we can't actually do anything with that transactive feedback signal. If, if we were able to instantiate nodes in the bulk power system, that feedback signal would be coming up and potentially influencing the supply side to adjust the generation mix. Since we want the Alstom model to try to follow the existing system's um, uh, pattern as closely as possible, we can't take that into account or we start to deviate from the existing real physical system. The um, utilities then are taking the transactive incentive signal and uh, any local information they need, and they're driving specific responsive assets. As I mentioned, a lot of them, for example, having water heater demand response units that they decide when to operate the demand response capability on the water heaters based on the patterns in the incentive signal, for example. Um, in some cases, we actually do have a local closed loop, because if I have a utility that's uh, using our demand charge function, they look at their own transactive feedback signal, which is their prediction of when they're going to have a high load hour on a, on a, or a high load day, which is what triggers the demand charges. 
And when they see that they're predicting that, then they would generate an incentive signal increase, which would trigger their demand response system to plan to operate when they would hit that high load hour. So we actually have the full loop in that particular case within the context of a local distribution utility. So as I mentioned earlier, we've been formalizing this uh, transactive control technique. We've got a transactive node object model that is a formal state machine model of what a transactive control node does. And because of that, that's one of the reasons why we say it's very scalable and, and it's based on algorithmic um, constructs that go into the functions that I mentioned earlier. It supports interoperability through, through the, the simple but precise definition of these signals, the transactive incentive signal and the transactive feedback signal. So those are specifically defined with XML schema that are documented. So I can now exchange those signals between any nodes and they will know both syntactically and semantically what they need or what they mean. So that's the level at which we've dealt with interoperability. And it's, and it's modular in nature with the ability to put these different uh, functions into the toolkit. So that's, that's really, we think, where the opportunity is in the long run. If, if, if we can deploy the common toolkit and now you come along with the best demand response avoidance toolkit function ever, you, know, you sell that to the utilities that care about that and they can plug it into the toolkit and you know, pay you for that, that uh, great function. So how are we doing on the project here? Um, so these were the objectives we had on one of the earlier slides. Uh, one of them that wasn't on that slide, but it's common with all the demonstration projects, is to just lay a foundation for Smart Grid through the different equipment, devices, and technology that the utilities are installing. So that's going well. The utilities have done that. We've got almost all of the assets installed. Um, the two-way communications and incentive signal and so forth, the integration of renewable energy and the standards for interoperable smart grid, those all really have to do with our development and implementation of the transactive control technology. That's implemented and deployed. We've been uh, doing the shake out of that, uh, validating that all the functions are operating the way we intended them to and correcting where they aren't. Um, the interoperability was all confirmed er very early in the project, so now it's just confirming the functionality. We've actually um, told three of the utilities to go ahead and engage their asset systems at this point so they can actually, uh, we can get direct observation of the impact on real assets. And, and all along the way and going forward, we're collecting the data, you know, baseline data and uh, installation cost data and then impact data from the utilities for the costs and benefits. We've defined uh, to do that um, just uh, around 90 test cases, 90 experiments, if you will, that are going on simultaneously here. You can see the, the uh, 11 utilities here listed. If you couldn't read the earlier thing with their names, you should be able to read it here. And they have uh, roughly 40 test cases having to do with transactive control. We have a small number of test cases for reliability that have nothing to do with transactive control. It's just taking advantage of some of the smart grid equipment they've installed. We have a, a much larger number having to do with conservation and efficiency. Again, not being driven by transactive control, but just taking advantage of the smart grid uh, technology they've installed. In some cases, we have a simultaneous or a pairing of a conservation and efficiency experiment with a transactive control experiment, largely where we're doing conservation voltage reduction and we can look at it statically, or we can enable the conservation voltage reduction to be variable responding to the incentive signal so that they're adjusting their total load down that feeder um, in response to the signal through that variability. Um, the project started in February of 2010. Um, we had a small startup phase where we did some conceptual design, did environmental documentation, things like that. Then we moved into the fall of, uh, well, into 2011 and 2012, basically in a detailed design and implementation period. Uh, did a three-phase release cycle approach where first we established basic connectivity, second we established information interoperability, and thirdly we, we put the functionality into the system. Um, last October 15th we started phase three, which is our test and evaluation period, data collection and analysis period. That will end in uh, February of 2015, um, and then we'll have uh, a couple of months to get things wrapped up. So actually, the whole project ends in February 2015. So we'll back that up about three months for when the phase four starts. Um, and you can see here the different um, sort of distinction between the phases here. 
So we're just well into that 2013 phase now. So what are the benefits of this project? Well, it's an opportunity to leverage the smart grid assets the region installs. It extends, as I mentioned, the Olympic Peninsula grid-wise demonstration that we did. It basically built on that technique, uh, made it a much more um, elaborate technique, in introduced the notion of forward forecasting as a key new feature, and, and did an uh, intense focus on standardization of the technique and interoperability. Do we have a question? Oh, I'm almost there, yeah. Okay, so um, let me, I've just got this one more slide. Let me get to that and then we can get to the question. So when the project's over, we're going to have uh, about 80 megawatts of assets um, that can respond. Um, we're, we'll, we'll have validated the transactive control technique, have a large number of smart grid assets installed in the region, but there is still more work to be done. I mean, there's even, though we've scaled it up to 11 utilities in five states, there's even more scale up that would be needed in the long run. We have to transition it from an R&D effort to an operations effort. We're, we're having a lot of very interesting discussions with Bonneville about how to do that and what the real specific key needs are that they could use help with, which is basically gets to that third bullet there of operationalizing it for balancing authorities, since fundamentally it's a question of how do you integrate wind, and in particular Bonneville's identified the errors in wind ramp prediction to be one of the key problems that they're facing and how do we engage more and more utilities in using this. Um, this is a DOE-funded project, so of course there's a disclaimer associated with that. And finally, we do have a project website uh, where you can download information about what each of the utilities are doing. We have an annual report there, um, monthly or quarterly newsletters and so forth. And with that, let me just say one last thing, since this is a cyber oriented group, we, have, we did have to explicitly develop an uh, interoperability and cybersecurity plan. Our cybersecurity plan uh, incorporates uh, sort of an industry best practices risk uh, management life cycle approach. As we worked with the utilities on that, uh, we found uh, a much, much variability across the utilities as to their level of sophistication with respect to cybersecurity. So, in some cases, we've been helping them um, learn more about it. In other cases, they've been helping each other learn more about it. And we, we have seminars periodically ourselves with cybersecurity experts who come in, and, and we invite all the participants to dial into those and, and learn more about the cybersecurity dimensions. So with that, let's take questions. I, I kept seeing something flash up there. That must have been the questions. Okay. Um, so going back a bit, uh, Clara Narstedt asks uh, about the transactive nodes, inputs and outputs. If the neighboring nodes exchange information, is there an issue of security or privacy? Um, privacy, no, simply because of the way we've defined these signals. You don't, uh, at least the way we're using it right now, and we think this would be robust in the larger scale as well. The, it's, the information is all aggregated, so you lose the um, you lose the ability to discern individual responses in that regard. In terms of overall cybersecurity, absolutely, and we we we're using a simple model with with uh, secure socket layer communications to um, um, provide the the sort of first level of security, and then we have some you know certificate based authentication between the different participants to help help make that happen. But absolutely, and there may be other security dimensions we haven't thought of yet that would need to be a attended to. And she also asks um, ab about electric vehicles. Where does the control entity reside in that coordinates the load between the charging EVs and the transformer? Does the proposed control scale? Uh, typically, uh, with the electric vehicle technologies I'm familiar with, some of which we've developed at PNNL, you have a smart charger station that the vehicle plugs into. And at least for this example, the assumption would be that you have such a smart charger station that's, that's the intermediate between the transformer and the vehicle itself. Um, and then from uh, Dick Wilson, we have uh, what technology is used to impl implement the supply node? And does the supply node logic have to be implemented on each distribution transformer, or is it uh, implemented centrally at the substation? No, this is this is distributed. First of all, so so in principle, 
it would live on the transformer for the example I just gave. The, the technology that we're using to implement this is IBM's Internet Scale Control System technology, which runs in J2ME and uses MQTT as the transport mechanism for transporting the data. Um, two of the utilities have decided to roll their own and based on our specification implemented their own um, nodes and we have a simple proxy uh, communications technique for them since they don't want to use MQTT. So, Okay. Uh, not so much a question, but a, a couple of observations um, that particularly in, in security of the smart grid that a lot of people think about uh, an asset that may have a uh, connection to a network and has a vulnerability and somebody can go in and exploit that vulnerability, make that device do something. But uh, as we move to smart grid and, and you're using uh, your, your uh, in transaction incentive signals and transaction feedback signals, is it? Yeah. Um, if you could actually insert bad information in those signals, uh, and this comes back to the stability question a, a little bit, could you potentially destabilize by intelligently injecting transaction integrity signals that locally make sense but globally could lead to some uh, destabilizing uh, condition? Well, probably. I mean, it, it points out it points out why integrity of the uh, control signals is one of the key uh, cybersecurity concerns for for control systems like this. But um, we do have some integrity checks beyond just the just the basic security. But but sure, if you were somehow able to get yourself in there in a man of the middle attack or something and introduce introduce erroneous incentive signals, you could potentially destabilize things. That's so, but. Um I, I guess, w would there be a way, uh, yeah, that, that, that's transaction, I'm sorry, that's integrity of the signal in, in, in the sense that it's, uh, you know, you're doing certificates and TLS and all that good stuff, but is there some kind of a, a check that these signals are consistent given the state, the physical state of the grid and, and the various uh, uh, plans from, from the end nodes and so forth? Well, it, we haven't tried to implement that right now, but there may be ways we could do that. Now, it's, it's, it's a challenge since we're representing the global state of the system in the incentive signal itself, not you know having some wide area broadcast here. The signal's unique to the path that it's followed. But it, anywhere we have nodes that receive multiple transactive incentive signals, one should uh, perhaps be able to see some kind of a correlation between them on a gross sense, and if you didn't see that, that might indicate that there was something wrong. That's just off the top of my head, so that would need further investigation to see if it really worked. But there may be things like that that you could do. You can also, of course, look at the historical temporal patterns and see if, if you're seeing something that deviates strongly and there's no other explanation for it. Uh, my question is if the network type topology is changed. I was wondering uh, how the uh, the transactive transactive node will change its uh, let's say the intelligent algorithm to response or uh, well the, the algorithms it? themselves are, are 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 really local. So so that's a configuration problem, and and that each node has a list of its neighbors, and so you would just update that list if the topology changed, so it knew who its new neighbors were or weren't. One of them went away, but it shouldn't, in principle, change the algorithms themselves, unless the function of the node changed. In which case, you would need a new set of algorithms because the function of the node itself changed. But what I mean is, like for example, even uh, in the original design, you have have several uh, number of nodes. Right now, the topology changed, and maybe the uh, the neighbors, the, the number of neighbor neighboring nodes decreased. So in this way, does it affect? Uh, Operation of that transacting node, or it shouldn't. Okay. It, it because that that's one of the the, the beauties of keeping the sim signals well defined and simple, because since we're only looking at sort of aggregated loads on the one side and cost of power delivered on the other side, as things change, I still have the same basic calculations to do. Those don't change at all. Okay. Uh, so, Ron, uh, about four years ago, a colleague and I um, thought about uh, a similar thing to what you've presented here, and I really like your guys' implementation. 
but uh, um, when we were talking about it, we were thinking about using something like a Dutch auction scheme to, to determine prices rather than, say, a, a prepared schedule. Did you guys put any thought into other uh, approaches um, rather than, than saying the, the user has to know their schedule about when they want to do something and instead do it based off of, say, a price signal um, inherently on its own? Not, you, you do fall to a price signal eventually. Well, we, we, we have something that, in effect, is a market closing through the interaction of the forward, forward signal, right? Which is it's basically like uh, determining a, a negotiation on a forward contract. Um, for this project, no. For this project, you know, we, we wanted to do it this way. Our other work from the Olympic Peninsula Gridwise demonstration, which then we also worked with AEP on for their GridSmart, demonstration project is. A, it's a double auction market. It doesn't have any forward forecast of price, though. It's based on the current five-minute period, in that case driven by constraints derived from the uh, locational marginal price ahead of the distribution feeder substation and managing that constraint through a double auction market with the uh, participating customers on the feeder. So we, we, we've worked in our research more broadly both, both ways. So the, the one thing you mentioned there um, was a concern that we thought about, too, in terms of forward market. So here you have a forward market prediction, per se, over some time window. Um, that brings up uh, a, a different take on, on say, mark-to-market pricing, which was what, uh, what ended Enron. Um, have you guys thought about the implications of, of that for companies gaming the accounting um, to, to, in essence, not be true to realism and instead be a a mark-to-market style accounting mechanism that, that then runs into like an Enron situation? No, we haven't tried to tackle that part of the problem yet, but, but yes. Okay, that we've got, we've got more questions. We'll try to be real quick. Just mm -hmm. a couple minutes. Um, yep, okay. Gustav Brunello wonders if the project investigated the impact of local storage at, distribu at the distribution level. If the distribution transformer is going to be overloaded, could you use local battery storage? Uh, the answer is y yes to both. Uh, uh, three or four of the project participants do have local distribution level storage in their projects. Um, we aren't actually going all the way down to distribution transformers to houses, uh, uh, shown as my hypothetical example, but absolutely you could include that as a part of that overall mix there. Okay, and last question real quickly. Uh, can you say more about the form of the feedback signals? Do the incentive signals are price-like but what form do the feedback signals take? Uh, kilowatts, how much I'm going to use, and it's over a forward, forward periods of time. One of the things commenting on the forward periods of time, we, we designed it for three days out because we weren't sure what kind of a view we needed. The, the, the time gets coarser and coarser as you go further out. Practically speaking, what we're finding now that we've got real data flowing in the system, it's only the next you know, 12 hours or so that are really all that helpful because things are so gross out beyond that that they're not all that helpful. Well, Ron, we've run out of time, but it's been a really interactive session, a really great presentation. We'd like to all thank you much uh, once more. Thank you. And let me just recap. Uh, someone pointed out to me, I said, we'll resume this seminar series next year. That's next academic year, which will be September first Friday of September 2013, only three months away. And remember, if you'd like to, we still have a few places left in our TCG uh, summer school on resilient uh, power systems, which will be the week of uh, June 17th, and you can uh, look at our website. Thank Bill, you. can I make a shameless plug for something? Oh, right ahead, if we're still So on. if you're really interested in this transactive control stuff, the Gridwise Architecture Council is uh, having the first international conference on workshop on transactive energy in Portland, Oregon in two weeks, uh, May 23rd and 24th. Go to gridwise, gridwiseac.org slash events. You can find out more information about that. Thanks, Ron.